Well, welcome, Wellness Warriors. We have a great, great interview for you today. I am so excited to welcome one of my favorite television stars from the show The Doctors, the star of The Bachelor, a handsome, a smart, a tall gentleman, Dr. Stork. Welcome to Wellness Warriors. Ah, thanks for having me, Dwayne. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm always intimidated when I have handsome, smart guys like you on the show. You know, I'm so envious of uh, all the things that God granted you. So welcome to the show. And I thought maybe you'd just start off by telling us where you grew up, how you grew up. Did you always want to be a doctor? Were you an athlete? Give us a little bit of background. Boy, oh boy, you, you start off to the races. I want to so, fire you up, man. Well, it, you know, it's interesting because you can say things like, hey, you're a doctor, I'm intimidated. But the truth is, I, I read your book, you've educated yourself quite well, you think a lot like a doctor, but we all go on a journey or a path in life. And certainly, I had no intentions of becoming a doctor, because I come from a family of Midwestern, primarily farmers. Uh, my dad sold cattle feed for a living, we bopped around the Midwest from I was born in Colorado, we lived in Wichita, Kansas, uh, Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, Missouri. And in all of that time growing up, I somehow, some way figured out that I have a pretty good scientific mind and math mind. So, you know, I go to college as a math major and I come out of college as an actuarial scientist, but very quickly realized, Wayne, that my job was primarily to use numbers to predict when people would die. So mind mm -hmm. you, Nothing that I was doing was helping the situation. I was simply running numbers saying, well, if you are a male and you're 65, you are most likely going to die within X number of years. You do your computer algorithms and then you can predict things like the potential cost of a retirement benefit plan or compensation. It's all numbers driven and it felt so abstract. So interestingly, zero medical background, zero doctors in my family, zero nurses in my family, zero healthcare providers in my family. I started volunteering at a free clinic in DC where I was living and something clicked. It was the this was end. after college. This was so after, this is after college. That's right. So I'm okay. probably 24 years old. I've been an actuary for a few years in Washington, DC. You know, I'm, I'm, enjoying my life, quite frankly, independent, learning a lot. And it just clicked that I was not meant to spend my life in front of a computer like we are right now. And you know what happened that was probably the most remarkable thing? My first job at this free clinic is I was in charge of the lab. And I would do things like urine dipsticks, very <laughs> mundane tasks. But one day, one of the doctors came and grabbed me and said, hey, Travis, do you want to come up front and you can learn how to take blood pressures, you can weigh people when they come in. And so the minute I started interacting with the patients who were coming into this free clinic, I felt a special connection unlike anything I'd ever felt before. Because even though all I was doing was taking someone's blood pressure, they were so grateful and also there was something unique about that experience of someone coming in scared about their health and as little as i knew i got good at taking blood pressure i got good at at, at doing all the vitals and the doctors one day and these are doctors volunteering we they took us out to have beers after after one of the clinics and i started asking questions like well how could I become a doctor? Is it too late? I, I haven't done any pre-med classes. And to all of them, to their credit said, go take classes at night. And so I did that. And then fast forward, here we are, I'm 48 years old. I've been a doctor for almost 20 years. Um, and it all started by just going to this free clinic and doing urine dipsticks. And it's kind of crazy because I never intended to be a doctor. I never intended to be on TV. I quite frankly remember and, and reading your story is similar to mine in the sense that I had all these health issues in my 20s, arthritis mm. in my feet, gastric ulcers, and knew nothing. And so it's, it's ironic that 
my, my career path changed because not only is it the career I was meant to have, but it's helped me so much mm. being 48 now to implement these changes in my own life. So selfishly, thank goodness, I'm not just still predicting when people will live. Actually, what I'm trying to do much like you is change the equation altogether. Yeah. Well, first of all, it sounds like we have a lot in common. I grew up on a ranch in Idaho, um, lived in Washington, D.C., in Vienna, Virginia, on Lawyers Road. Um, and my first job out of college was running a clinic in a prison. So, uh, you know, a lot of similarities in our background. Was there, so you didn't have anybody that was really a mentor. It sounds like this was a serendipitous event where you got into medical school. Was there a particular kind of medicine that you wanted to practice? No, I was naive enough and idealistic enough back then, Dwayne. And I, I, I don't, you know, we can have a separate conversation about healthcare versus, um, versus doctoring. Let me, let me put it that way. So my, my, my number one goal, and I went back to my journal recently, you know, my number one goal was to be able to have sound scientific knowledge, apply that to my patients, but more than anything, whatever doctor I wanted to become, I wanted to be the guy that when, when the shit hit the fan, no, no pun intended, that people would feel like they came to the right guy. And that naturally transitioned itself during med school into becoming an ER doctor because the one thing for whatever reason over time I, I developed is this ability to quickly um, interact with people from all walks of life, put them hopefully at comfort during distressing situations. And my first, quite honestly, my first rotation was emergency medicine. I was at University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And my very first shift was just this crazy traumatic, I mean, it was, Without getting into too many details, uh, you know, a woman came in in her 60s and within 30 minutes from a ruptured aortic aneurysm, abdominal aortic aneurysm, died. And wow. it was so sad to watch it happen. But at the same time, I sat there with awe because I was a medical student. I didn't quite frankly really know what to do yet, but I watched the ER doctor who was in charge run that situation. And despite his best efforts, she did not live, which is awful. But at the same time, what he and the rest of the team did during that experience, not only for her emotionally, but for her family, it was, it was profound and I knew right then and there I wanted to be an ER doctor because what people don't realize in the ER, it's as much about the science of medicine as it is the social elements of medicine. And it's such a great, perfect combination of mm. you're dealing with, with humans in a way that is so pure and raw and yet mm -hmm. you're also applying the science of medicine. And so it really was the perfect fit. And once, once I did that, it was one thousand percent I knew what I wanted to do but what's cool about emergency medicine is you take care of any and all problems so for the rest of medical school and even during residency when you're an ER doc you do a lot of rotations in other fields right so if I'm doing a, a, a month in surgery you know what I'm paying close attention because that all translates to to being a good ER doctor if you're doing a month of pediatrics well maybe a third of my patients are going to be kids. So uh, OB, delivering babies. Well, babies get delivered in the ER. So it was, um, it was actually a blessing that I decided early on ER was for me because I never lost focus. And, you know, yeah. it can be a grind. It's a med school and residency. It's a, it's a grind at times. Yeah, well, you, you remind me a lot. My wife uh, was a trauma nurse uh, for 20 plus years at Harborview in Seattle, which is the I don't know if you've ever heard of Harvey View. It's the highest oh, yeah. level trauma in the region. And she speaks about, you know, her fondness of the ER and the teamwork and the camaraderie. And, you know, I think, you know, instincts play such a big uh, part of that as well. You know, the guy that's been the 20 year ER doc that's seen it all, done it all, heard it all. And, you know, the instincts that they have that in that split second can save somebody's life or you know, or, or let somebody pass away. So, you know, thank you for that tour of duty. I, 
I guess I'd like to pivot a little bit and just say, was there ever a time, I'm going to ask you a two-part question. Was there ever a time where after you, you started that job in the ER where you just said, I don't, I don't know if I can do this, man. I don't know if I can be a doctor. And the part B of that question is what's your biggest frustration with the current healthcare system? Over the last two decades, I'm going to start with that last question. And I have seen a slow migration putting profits ahead of patients. When I first went to medical school, we did not even talk about money. It was all about learning, providing great care for patients. Patients were always number one. That's what I was taught. That's what I taught. And that has all changed uh, in a way that is, is really sad. And, you know, that, that is a reality that is hard to stomach. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that the, you know, the healthcare warriors out there aren't doing their best. The system is what's broken. And it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to recognize that, but it's also incumbent upon all of us and why I, I've spent so much of my career talking about prevention because we cannot count on our healthcare system to save us from disease. We have to do the best we can. And then despite doing everything right, you can still get a cancer diagnosis. You can still get a diabetes diagnosis. And then that's when we rely on the healthcare system and we find a good partner in healthcare. But um, I have learned that, and, and just going to speak the truth here, Dwayne, I don't take it lightly. For instance, my, my baby the other week wasn't doing great. Um, severe diarrhea was starting to look a little dehydrated. And I told my wife, I said, Paris, taking the child or any of us to the ER right now isn't without consequences. We have to understand that when you when you get in when you get into the healthcare system, a lot can happen. Um, and so luckily my background as an ER doctor, you know, I knew that as long as he continued to feed well, he was going to be okay. And he did great. If he needed the ER, we were going to go to the ER, but you have to, and you, you talk about this in your book a little bit, you know, it's so important that we become the CEO of our health. And right. if we do go to the ER, go talk to our doctor, do not give up complete control. You say, okay, doc, what are, you know, what are my options here? What would you do if this was your family member? And those conversations are probably too few and far between right now. And I still believe in, in our healthcare system to, to save people from just calamitous situations. I still very much believe that the U.S. healthcare system probably does that better than any other. But, and, and I, wanna, I wanna add this without going off on too much of a diatribe. You know what one of the hardest things about being a good doctor is? What's that? In our healthcare system, it's making the decision sometimes to do less rather than more. Hmm. And what I mean that. by that is, you know, if, so two things, one could be with testing. If you come into the ER with abdominal pain and you end up with a whole slew of tests that let's just say they're not necessary and you get an abdominal CT scan and you get all these other tests, um, you can easily over test creating a whole new slew of issues with treatment. And I, I remember like it was yesterday, the first time, uh, I, I came back to Vanderbilt as an attending physician and I had one particular night, all these people coming in with chronic low back pain. And I told the resident physicians, look, we're not just going to give these patients Oxycontin because that will mask their pain. It won't address it. And it's, so I, I would highlight things like, okay, let's do less. Let's do less with the medications and more with things like acupuncture. Let's refer them for the kinds of, with, let's refer them to treatments like rehab where they may actually get better. But in, in medicine, the challenge is sometimes to say, you know what, we're not going to start you on a narcotic. We're not going to, um, even, even in a situation where uh, someone is, it comes in acutely ill, sometimes the hardest thing is to say, you know what, 
we're not going to start a medication that is going to artificially increase their blood pressure until the patient lets me know if they might be able to come through this on their own. And so our healthcare system, and I will no, no longer go on the diatribe, our, our healthcare system encourages over testing and over treatment. And it is, you know, every test you run, every treatment you perform, it's, you know, it, it's more money yeah. in the system at times. And so it's, um, but, it, so that can be a challenge. But haven't we conditioned the customer that that's the expectation? And if they get less than that, then they feel like the doctor's incompetent or, you know, not aggressive enough or whatever. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the, the, the problem? I mean, the customer goes to the ER, they want a pill, they want, it's like Jiffy Loop medicine, right? It fix me in 60 seconds or less and get me out the door and I want to be all better. And they don't really want to address the underlying issues that they had three cheeseburgers that week or haven't exercised in five years or they 40 pounds more than they were five years ago or whatever. Um, so, I mean, the, as a country, and you know, you hit the nail on the head, the healthcare system profits from this lapse in judgment. And then, you know, we're trying to administer some pill or treatment that's really masking the underlying issue. These conversations, and one of the reasons why I found myself really feeling blessed for being in the media, quite frankly, which I never planned, is that we could talk about these things honestly, openly, with transparency. Even this conversation right now, Dwayne, if you, so let's just use the example of something very minor, the cold virus. If you catch a cold, the natural life of that virus, you know, you might not feel great for seven to 10 days. And you might have, even after, you might have a bit of a residual cough from all that post-nasal drip. In this country, we're all conditioned to go to the doctor and say, give me an antibiotic. Right. The only way to combat that is to educate. And I think, again, that's part of what, what uh, you do. It's part of what I do. And some of the, like you said, you hit the nail on it. Some of the best doctors in the world and in this country are the ones who say, you know what, you don't need that. You don't need that. And, um, and it's hard to do because it's much easier as a doctor to just give you stuff that you don't need than to explain why you don't need it. Um, I do think patients, and maybe you can give me your thoughts on this, but I think patients are becoming more in tune with with what they want and need i think people are becoming more likely to ask hey doc do i really need this antibiotic which if i take it mind you may completely disrupt my gut microbiome you know do, do it's i not really go away in a... that's right yeah um, well you know i live in italy in in non-covid times i live in italy two months out of the year and that totally changed my perspective on how you know how screwed up america was right and you know we we have this pride in who we are as americans which i'm very supportive of you know we're the best at everything well you know we're we're in the in the 38th in healthcare in the world you know that's not i'm, I'm not sure i'd want to be the 38th base, best baseball team or the 38th you know best on airplane safety or whatever you know it's just not that great and what I find in Italy, you know, one day I just did a, I decided I was just going to go out and ask people how many people had antibiotics. And I'm not talking about 10 year olds. I'm talking about 50 year olds. And so, you know, when I went to my favorite deli, I asked, when I went to the coffee shop, I asked five out of the seven people I asked had never been on antibiotics in their entire life. Now go do that same test with 30 to 60 year olds in America. A hundred percent of the people would be on antibiotics, right? So it's, it's, you know, and, you know, Italians aren't the healthiest people. They love their wine, you know, more, you know, three times as many people smoke in the league as we do, but they live three, three to four years longer than we do. And so you have to ask, well, what is it? Well, you know, I think there's a lot less stress there. I think the healthcare system is more preventative. You know, people walk a lot more, they get a lot more exercise. They're, you know, you go to the grocery store, 
if you don't buy what you want when you walk in, it will not be there tomorrow. It's kind of like Costco. So, you know, you're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to be stuff on the grocery store for two weeks. You know, you're not going to have strawberries the size of tennis balls. It's all, you know, farm to table. So I just think there's so much we can learn from other countries about, you know, what we're doing. We've become this quick, you know, I love to call it the Jiffy Loop Society because, you know, it's in and out, in and out, right? And that's not how healthcare works. I mean, we have to, we have to look at the underlying conditions and say, hey, this is a marathon. How do I get to 85 and reasonable health? And, you know, what are the things that I'm doing that are killing me? You know, is it the sugar? Is it, you know, my, my family's fraught with diabetes. Um, and my wife's family is too. So, you know, I've been on the pre-diabetic train for about five years now trying mm -hmm. to stave it off. And, uh, you know, everyone in my family's had it by 45. And, you know, I'm be 62 next month. And I, I my A1C Looking is good, five Wayne. Good. Yeah, well, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm trying the battle, man. But I just, I just wonder, you know, Dr. Stark, if you were president tomorrow, knowing the things that you know about medicine, what changes would you make in healthcare? I put health back in the term healthcare. And, you know, one of the things we know in life is when you measure outcomes versus just charging for the number of things that are done to a patient, patients have better outcomes. I mean, it's, it's not always easy to do, but as a society, it's incumbent upon us. And you, I loved your sports analogy, by the way. If you had, if there were 38 baseball teams and you're the 38th best baseball team with by far the highest payroll, like your payroll is double to triple every other team. Right. And you, every year you finish last, you're telling me that, that you're not going to fire your general manager, that you're not going to go out yeah. and maybe switch out a few pitchers, change your lineup. Um, the reason – you know, the reason that we haven't in this country yet is because obviously um, healthcare is a very powerful industry and does a lot of good. But I think the most important thing would be shifting things so that we, again, put patients first so that patient outcomes drive a lot of the profits. And I still think, you know, if you look at our healthcare system, let's just say 20% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. Boy, oh boy, if I'm president, you give me that much money, I swear to you, I can put America at number one. And I know it. Uh, the power to do that with all the competing lobbies can be quite challenging. And we, somewhere along the lines, you know this as well as I do. You're, you said your wife um, spent so many years in the ICU. Somewhere along the line, doctors lost control of health care. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, this is what, you, this is what we get. And it's, it's broken but that doesn't mean it can't be fixed. Yeah. You know, I, I, I noticed in reading some of your stories, you're big on natural medicine, alternative medicine, you know, natural paths, acupuncturists, those kinds of things. I, I, I know you read my book. So I, I see a, a, a woman named Dr. Becky Sue, who was a, a surgeon in China and then moved to the U.S., became a, a, a naturopath, an herbologist, an acupuncturist. And I see her every week. And I, I tell people, Hey, if I was on a desert island, I could pick one medical professional, no offense to you, that I would pick Dr. Becky Sue. Um, because she looks at my body, uh, first of all, holistically, and she looks at my body from a preventative measure. You know, and she'll say, oh, your tongue, your heart looks like it's tired. You've not got enough sleep this week. I really want you to focus this week on you know, going to bed early and more sleep and so on. So everything's ahead of the game, right? And America, it's, it's all about we get really sick and then we want to be fixed, right? And so I love the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm very focused on prevention. Talk to me because I know you've had a couple issues with your own health and your back and your feet and so on about how, how you think we should integrate alternative medicine and preventive medicine into our health care. couple tenets. Number one, first and foremost, do no harm. And I took that oath, the Hippocratic oath. Number two, data. So I am into alternative therapies that work. And I think that's important. I think there, there's a lot of uh, snake oil being sold out there. Having said yeah. that, we also know the incredible 
impact of placebos. And so I'm a firm believer that if you're taking something or doing something and it's not doing harm and you feel personally like it's showing a benefit, mm -hmm. even if, even if the population data doesn't show a huge benefit, if for you, you feel better and it's doing no harm, by all means do it. But secondly, so, a lot of the data supports these alternative therapies back to acupuncture. You know, someone who is dealing with say chronic headaches or chronic back pain, you combine acupuncture with old school massage therapy. And during those treatments, you focus on deep breathing and relaxation. And then all of a sudden you do that and you go home, you sleep better. And you yeah. wake up and because you feel better, you make a better breakfast choice. You know, th this virtuous cycle of good health, you can't tell me that that isn't just as powerful and quite frankly, more effective than just saying, hey, you know what, because this is easy, why don't you just head over to the pharmacy here and pick up this pill? So I, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, for some reason, and, and maybe Italy's different, I've the only, the only stint of time I spent in Europe was 15 plus years ago as the bachelor in Paris. <laughs> and let me tell you, I, I laugh, but the truth is my experience during those two months was exactly what you described in Italy, which is people were very active. They, they were living their lives. Um, there is, you know, in our society in America, quite frankly, walking is kind of considered an alternative therapy because it's not like you go to the doctor and your doctor says, okay, I want you to do these five things. Number one, I want you to walk every day for 30 minutes. That doesn't happen. Instead, it's number yeah. one, I want you to take this pill at 8 a.m. Number two, I want you to take yeah. this pill at 10 a.m. And so to me, the beauty of alternative therapies that do no harm is it becomes a part of this virtuous cycle of good health. And if you're like me, you know, I take a few supplements. The supplements I take are the ones that I think show great data for me. I take turmeric supplement every day by Qnol because quite frankly, I have arthritis and mm -hmm. I feel better. It's a great, sure. and, it's a great answer. You know, for you. That's right. And I, I suspect, and I read it in your book as well, that, you know, you look at the data the same way. And so I am still somewhat shocked that people do not go into our healthcare system. And let's just say even post-op, instead of just giving drugs that we know can be addictive, we should give a potpourri. Anti-inflammatories, for instance, that we know, A, do no harm and may have secondary benefits. And I mentioned turmeric with curcumin in it. So, you know, that is an evolution that is happening. When I went to medical school, I would have laughed at you if you had told me that there was such a thing as lifestyle medicine. If you had yeah. told me that there was a huge movement in anti-aging in medicine, it's happening and it's just a matter of time. And the beauty of it is the more we talk about it, I think the more it becomes um, the common way of doing things. Can you imagine if you came to the ER, Dwayne, with a headache and you leave there with a list of things to do to improve your headaches. And it may include medication, no doubt about it. But I actually, along with all of my colleagues, give you actionable steps that you can incorporate into your life that we know, based on data, will make you feel better. If we can get to that place, and, and the reason we haven't is because it's hard, and it doesn't, again, the system doesn't get paid for that. Mm -hmm. But... I still have this dream that you go into any doctor's office in the country and you walk away and you get more than a pill. You get these interventions, these lifestyle interventions. Yeah. I'm convinced Boy, it works. I'm, a, I'm on your train, brother. I'm on your train because, you know, you, you talked about going to the ER, you know, in, in Japan, and you probably read this in my book, but if you have high blood pressure, if you have heart disease, if you're stressed out, the, the doctor writes you a prescription for forest bathing to go walk in the forest three times a week. And they have, they have documented where this is better than blood pressure medicine. Meditation, you know, there, I mean, the American Heart Association came out and said, meditation is about three to four times more effective than any heart medication.
So, I mean, I do transcendental meditation. I'm going to do my 20 minutes right after I get done with this call every day. So, you know, there's all of these things out there. And the, the problem is we have access to global health and we don't take advantage of it. You know, the, the data, the science, the, the studies are all out there. You know, what Japan does, what Italy does, what they do in Sweden, you know, all these things. And when I, when I wrote 30 Summers More, I threw myself into all kinds of crazy testing you know, that was bizarre, you know, hyperbaric therapy or, you know, getting into cold plunges or taking all kinds of crazy herbs, much to the chagrin of my personal physician who said, God, you're going to kill yourself. And I, I wanted to represent what I thought worked and what didn't work, right? And, you know, there's so many things other than taking the normal pill that works. I mean, I can take my blood pressure down 15 points in a 20 minute meditation. I, and, you know, one of the things that I advise people to do is every day document your own baseline. I mean, I take my blood sugar, my weight, my blood pressure, my sleep, my deep sleep, my REM sleep. Every day I document it in my iPad. So, you know, when you do go in, you can say, well, this is not my baseline. You know, I know what's going on. And your body will tell you, you know, no offense to our medical system, but your body will tell you, right, if it's, there's a problem. You, you'll feel it. Your numbers will, will change everything else. You have the information yourself. So I so appreciate your views. And I, I love the fact that you're a math major because I'm a business guy at heart. You know, I mean, you know, our company owns $3, $3 billion in real estate. So I, I, I love numbers, believe me. And I think when you combine numbers and, and data in terms of real things that works and the percentage of things that work, you come up with real workable medicine that's not conflicted. And I think that's the problem right now with our medicine, with our healthcare system, it's conflicted, right? Who are we trying to please? The insurance companies, the government, the customer, the hospital, the for-profit entity? Who's, who, who are we trying to win here with? And you can't win with all of them. So you, you, you got to go back to looking at the highest percentage of, of wins that for treatment. And if that's meditation, if that's a walk in the forest, you know, regardless of profit, we should be prescribing them. I couldn't agree more. And, and incidentally, people should enjoy the things that make them feel better. It shouldn't feel like a chore. So you mentioned forest bathing. You know, I'm someone who, I have to confess, I, um, I've tried transcendental meditation. I tend to be someone who's a little, I'm not great at it. And what I've found is that I have to go for a walk in the woods and I find my own way of meditating, if you will, and I'm not forcing it. And that's what works for me. And I think that's also the beauty of people kind of picking their path through all these potential things that can help you live longer and feel better. And if, if you do two 20 minute sessions a day of, of meditation, my hat off to you, my hat's off to you because that is amazing. And I think that the ability to do that says something about you that is amazing, truly amazing because your ability to just shut things off is, I mean, that is, <laughs> I admire it so much. Well, I, I have to tell you though, that's, that's not a natural thing for me. You know, I, I coined the term fire brain because my brain is busy. I mean, if I get up to pee in the middle of the night, I'll lay there for 45 minutes and go, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start this company. I'm going to, you know, my brain is on fire. So the thing about TM is it takes a lot of practice. It took me probably six months of keep just forcing myself, forcing myself till I got it down. It's, it, it, I'm not the kind of person, I'm probably more like you than you think that, you know, I can just go, oh, I'm going to meditate. Boom. And sometimes, it, you know, I get to 18 minutes. I'm like, I can't do another freaking second. But there is an art to it. And, you know, I'd be happy to tell you my secrets offline about how you get good at it. Um, because once you get in that place, you, you almost start to crave it, right? It's like, oh, I need to go do that. It's your body right. feels the benefit. Two questions then. A, what time do you do your meditative sessions? And B, what chair do you use? <laughs> because I, 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 I've, I've, I've tried sometimes and I'm sitting in a chair and I'm like, gosh, my back is cramping up here. Do you have a, do yeah. you have a med meditation chair you use? I have one that I, you know, we have different homes in different places, right? So 
it's not, you know, I, I would say 50% of the time it's in my bedroom in the chair that's in my bedroom that's super comfortable, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to do it in your office chair or something or, you know, a couch, something that you're super comfortable with. I mean, I'm in what I call my sports room right now and it has four big recliners in it. And so, you know, I'll do it in here sometimes. But um, I usually do it in the morning. They, they advise you not to do it with, within an hour of getting up because you're still groggy and sleepy and so on. But, um, you know, there's times that I do it at four in the afternoon or three in the afternoon. I mean, I, like you, I have a busy schedule and, you know, you can't take your phone in there and your phone's buzzing and ringing all the time. And what you, the important thing is you, you really have to give your mind permission to let things go, right? And what people try to do, the biggest mistake people do in TM, and I, I teach TM to my staff. So every two weeks I do an online TM kit class and there's usually about 80 to 100 people on the class and I do 45 minutes. And um, the biggest thing people try to do is like, they're going, oh, oh shit, I'm thinking about something. Oh, I'm, I'm failing, right? And what I tell people is this is like looking at an aquarium your thoughts are the fish that are going by and you just let the thoughts swim by, right? You just let them go by. And when you release that and then go back to your mantra, that's why the mantra is so important because it provides focus, right? And then you go back to the mantra, pretty soon you're more into the mantra than you are in the thoughts. At the beginning, you know, it's 90% thoughts, 10% mantra. And you think, oh, I'm, I'm failing, I'm failing. There's no failing. It's just, you just keep getting better at it. So, you know, if you ever want to call me offline and I'd even be happy to do a guided one with you where you'd be surprised. I, I do guided ones for 25 minutes with people and I ask them, how, how many, how, how long do you think you were meditating? And people say, I don't know, seven minutes, eight minutes. And then I show them the clock. And it's like, no, it's 26 minutes. They're like, there's no way I could have done that. So if you ever you, want to you, guided med Well, I may take you up on that, but, but even more acutely, you've motivated me and I'll let you know how it goes, but I'm going to starting today because we have a, a four month old here who, as you know, babies can be somewhat disruptive, but what's interesting is I found myself as of late, sometimes I'll even be sitting there with, with him in my arms and I'll find myself almost naturally getting into this breathing pattern that combines with his and I, and, I, and it reminds me of how I felt when I have had a good quote unquote meditation session. Cause I've had a few yeah. good ones over the years, <laughs> out of hundreds of attempts. So I'm going to commit, and this is why we do this stuff because right. we can all do better. I'm going to commit today to, uh, to try and a meditation session and I'll let you know how it goes because I, good. I'm with you. I've, when I've, I have had a few good ones and you know, we're all, you talk about midlife in your book and I'm right there. I'm 48, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes runs in my family, my blood pressure, I hate to say this, but you know, it's been, it's always been borderline hypertension and there's no reason I'm not doing a better job with, with this. I need, I need to do better. I need to do some meditation because quite frankly, my blood pressure has not been the best as of late with the baby yeah. and the lack of sleep. And quite honestly, you, you do end up shortcuts sometimes. It's like, Oh, I don't know what to do food wise. Okay. Just order Uber eats. <laughs> right. Hey, I've been there. And, and you know, we've, I found, cause I have blood pressure issues myself, but it's, it's actually sugar is more uh, harmful than salt that, you know, your sugar contact will actually take your blood sugar up higher than, than the salt contact. And it's, it's interesting. I, I, I don't want to take too much more of your time. You have been such an awesome guest, but I just, I want to ask you on the doctors, when you were doing the show, has there been something, a guest that's come on, a story of another doctor, something that it was just an aha moment for you where you just looked at this and said, Oh my God, I never even thought of that. I never thought that would work. Or that's, a, that's amazing that something that was, you know, some case study, some, some patient, some alternative thing that came to you and you just went, wow, that's, that's really, that's really interesting. I'm going to put that in my practice or I'm going to try it personally or whatever. Anything come to mind? Well, I'll share a story from my last season hosting the show, which was, 
last season. And I hosted that show for 12 years, a lot of great memories, but, and, and her name escapes me. I should look it up and, and, and share it with you, but she's a doctor from Iowa and developed multiple sclerosis with really severe symptoms, couldn't even get out of a wheelchair. And she created her own diet. And it included all kinds of things that you would not necessarily think would improve your health. And she would eat organ meat. And she put together a cornucopia of certain vegetables. And she was able to essentially take her MS, which we know is an autoimmune condition, decrease the inflammation in her body to the point where she's now an avid bicyclist. She now coaches other doctors about using this technique with certain patients. And I think it highlights how we all have to be open-minded because if we get so stuck in the sand and believe one thing, then we have to we have to ask ourselves why we are so um, unwilling to at least listen. And, and in some ways, isn't that where we're at as a country right now? It's like yeah. we're stuck in the sand one side or the other. We don't want to listen to you. Your ideas are bad. Well, just using her as an example, you know, I, I started – thinking about, okay, what, what might be working here? And I'm working on a book right now and, and I'm primarily a vegetarian based eater. I, I, I eat fish, lots of fruits and veggies, big bean guy, love, love nuts. Um, but then I start reading about organ meat and how eating liver <laughs> may for some people really have great health benefits. And certainly in the case of of um, people with this autoimmune condition, it's sh for some of them, it showed great benefit. And here I am, someone who last time I ate liver was when I was 12 years old and I spit it out and I said, oh. mom, never again. And now I am, here I am 48, trying to talk my wife into including it every now and then. <laughs> and I still have a liver it. tonight. <laughs> yeah. And a bottle of Chianti. <laughs> yes. Have you? Do you ever? Do you ever eat organ meat out of curiosity? I just, you know, I I actually liked liver when I was, you know, growing up. I mean, we used to have liver probably twice a month, and uh, I just, you know, in my mind, I have this idea that organ meat is bad. Um, but you know, the, this goes to the personalization of medicine, right? Yep. I mean, it's whatever you know. You you, you know the the studies that I've done. So your genetics only make up about 23% of your health, right? It's now that's 23% is significant, but it's not, it's not 90%. And so, you know, it's like, I told a story in my book about uh, Dr. Becky Sue, the one doctor that I go to every week. She started seeing these people that were from Seattle that were going to vacation in Hawaii. And they'd come back with all these rashes and she'd say, did you eat a lot of mangoes in Hawaii? And they're like, yeah, we eat mangoes every day. She goes, you can't eat mangoes every day. You, you growing up in Seattle, do not have the body compensation to, you know, to break down mangoes in a way that Hawaiians do. Oh, what do you mean, right? So we're, we are adaptive in terms of where we grow up in our regions. And so I just think the personalization of food and food is medicine is built into our geography and you know what they do in Paris and how they eat may not you know be the same in Des Moines Iowa so maybe I'll try eating liver I, is it the iron well, component to have autoimmune or what it's all you know if you think about it organ meats are incredibly nutrient rich unlike most of the meat we eat is muscle and fat and so it's right. you know um it's not just iron, it's antioxidant rich as well. And so moral of the story is I'm not a guy out here who's at all recommending a carnivore diet. I, rare, I eat meat probably once or twice a month. Um, and I eat fish once or twice a week. My whole thing and, and why she was such a profound guest is that, you know, if you're not feeling good for whatever reason, and you don't feel like you have any answers, as long as back to my tenant of do no harm, 
there is no harm in experimenting. And if you, let's just say you spent your whole life eating a certain way, be open-minded, be willing to try things again, doing no harm. And you may never, you may never know how great you'll end up feeling unless you try it. And yeah. I'll, I'll end with this thought for myself. You know, I, I used to have much like you, I, I had plenty of physical ailments <laughs> and every day waking up, just feeling quite frankly, like I was 88. I'm 48 now. I had surgery on my spine about three years ago and sort of re committing myself to eating really good, great food that I enjoy, primarily plant-based, has done wonders for myself. And growing up a meat eater, family, like literally spending so much time on a farm raising cattle, it, it's, it, you have to be flexible. And if I've learned one thing in all these years, what works for me may not work for you. And that's why when it right. comes to your health, nobody should know your health better than you. And if you want to experiment with something that you know isn't going to hurt you, who, who am I to tell you as a doctor that you can't just a do no harm. And then last but not least B don't, don't break your bank experimenting with something that has right. no good data behind it. And ultimately you're going to find what works for you. Um, and, and that's what this is all about. Enjoying the process. I have to ask you before you go, because one of the things that, that I will openly admit my wife and I have grown quite fond of is especially now as parents is we really like at the end of the day to have a nice glass of red wine. We've been talking about going to Italy for a long time and I don't know when our, when our baby is going to allow this to happen, but if you could name one place in Italy to go spend a month, where would it be? You know, we've spent time all over Italy. Uh, my favorite place in the world is Capri. Um, and if, it's a perfect place to take your wife because it's super romantic and it's a perfect place to take your young child because it's super safe and family oriented. And, um, and I've been to, I've traveled to 84 countries. So this is my number one place in the world that I've been. And so it's a, it's a small Island right off the coast. Um, you, you go out of Naples, you go on a boat or a ferry. And, you know, 45 minutes later, you're in magical land. It's, it's the only place I tell people where the actual place is better than the brochures, right? I mean, it's like you go to places and you see all the marketing and you get there and you're like, yes, it's not what I thought. This is better than you thought. And, and uh, I could hook you up with two or three people and the restaurants are phenomenal. And it's, I tell you where to stay and it's a magical place. So that's oh, my, my travel tip for you. Thank you for that tip. and. and keep up the great work with what you're doing, promoting wellness. And it's, it's always fun to talk to someone who uh, is, is fired up about getting the message out, good health, that we have a lot of control, that we're empowered. I mean, it's a, sometimes you feel as a doctor, sometimes I feel like I'm counterculture screaming from the rooftops and no one's listening. But, you know, I, I, uh, I love talking with people like you who you're not, directly in the healthcare field, but in indirectly in so many ways you are. So thanks for that. Well, Dwayne, thanks well, a thanks, lot. My friend. You have been awesome. It's been an honor to have you on the show. And I feel like I've met a lifelong friend here. So let's keep in touch. Sounds great. Have a good day.